good evening, everyone. Um, thank you, Professor Johnson, and thank you, Auntie Rhonda, for your beautiful welcome. My name is Karen Williams, and I too speak from Darrowell land and would like to acknowledge the traditional custodians of the land. I'm here to talk about family violence, which, as you know, is a major health issue. It's interesting to think that back in 2021, it was considered a woman's issue or a feminist issue. The consideration of the socially aware, some might say the political left. Back then, even though family violence was the biggest cause of mortality and mor morbidity in women, domestic violence was barely touched on in my medical training. We may have had the occasional lecture on some of the consequences of it, but in no way were we taught the enormous implications of violence on our mental and physical health, nor were we really aware of the far-reaching social implications that came from that blindness. A few things have shifted over this time since 2021. In 2021, we were a society that was really so privileged in many ways that there were many people who didn't care about who ran the country. Some of us didn't have to care. Some of us voted for whoever our friends and families voted for. But what was born out of the worldwide pandemic of COVID-19 and the ongoing environmental changes and catastrophes that have come as a consequence of global warming was that suddenly people did have to care. There were more people displaced. There were more people experiencing a loss of the privileges that they had previously enjoyed. Sadly, COVID also resulted in the demise of the Murdoch family and a, an awareness of truth caused a groundswell of change. Ground, grassroots organisations started to develop, consisting of those who had suffered from the trauma of homelessness, loss of lives and loss of livelihoods. Those in positions of power had to actually demonstrate that they were going to do things. They finally had to show that they would respond to the needs of all of its people, and this time that would include women. What we saw was a huge shift away from the hyper-capitalist consumer culture to one which valued and actively sought a world that was far more equitable and far more reflective on how we responded to that lack of equity. There were other things that happened too, and as these changes were occurring, what we saw was a change in our culture of victim blaming around family violence. This was a direct result around the fact that there was an ignorance around coercive control. People didn't understand that women remained in dangerous relationships because there was very little safe alternative. And this led them to remain in a fawning type relationship with the aggressor. For those on the outside, this looked like she didn't want to help herself. This looked like she was part of the problem because she didn't want to try to leave. Not only was coercive control being perpetrated on her by her abuser, but the system also fostered that abuse by telling her that she was part of the problem because she didn't pursue charges or because she did not save herself and her children from her abuser. There was only a few outcomes for women who were being abused. One would be that no one would ever find out about the abuse and she would live with the ongoing torture of family violence for decades and her children too would be exposed to that violence. The other outcome would be that someone might find out about that abuse, for example, child protection. But what could happen would be that their response would be punitive and the child would be removed from the mother. Or she might choose to leave, but then she had to go through the hurdle of the family law court, where the moment she stepped in, she would be accused of lying, of being an alienator. And it was really, really common for abused women to have her children removed and given to the perpetrator himself. In any event, good outcomes were really rare, but this is different now because our approach to management is so much better. We didn't really have much in the way of primary prevention back in 2021. Primary prevention being dealing with the domestic violence before it were to happen. So and now in 2031, we have a range of measures that we didn't see before, a huge emphasis on social welfare, free childcare for all women, no matter her household income. All children are taught how to identify coercion. They're taught about healthy, safe sex um, practices, how to identify abuse, how to recognise grooming. And this starts in primary school and continues all through the child's education. Financial management is also a compulsory subject. Teachers are taught to identify signs of trauma without immediately assuming that the child has ADHD or a conduct disorder. Women have their own online health record for which they have control over. And there is early identification and options for at-risk families. We had a huge emphasis in 2021 on secondary prevention. So that is dealing with a crisis. In 2021, that focus looked like 
police recording assaults every 20 to 30 minutes, but that was really all that they were doing. The outcome of recording lots of assaults is, is a big um, database of recorded assaults, but very little in the way of convictions and very little reduction in safety overall. The cost was enormous and huge amounts of money were invested with no real outcome. In fact, police involvement would be very often a traumatic encounter in and of itself. So now police must demonstrate genuine attempts to assess the safety of women seeking help, as well as to help her secure the evidence that she might need, including video recordings, taping phone calls, and there are actual consequences for perpetrators beyond AVOs. Now that we have family and sexual violence experts embedded in the police station, along with mandatory trauma-informed training, things have improved and it will continue to improve as accountability measures are now heavily employed within the service. Obviously for secondary prevention to be effective and not just further traumatising, it wasn't just the police that needed further training. Our entire workforce that responds to family violence needed to understand the traumatic impacts of family violence. So now that includes all healthcare workers, emergency workers, teachers and lawyers. Everybody in the community needs to understand the impact of family violence so that at the very least our community doesn't do more damage. And then there's tertiary prevention to so dealing with the long term impacts of, of family and sexual violence. And that brings me to where I originally started my journey as a psychiatrist. Back then, women and children who were tortured by their partner were not considered to be as tortured as, say, a police officer or defence personnel. So what I was seeing as a general psychiatrist was women who had been strangled, who had had head injuries, who'd been made to eat dog food, who were raped, who had been held hostage, who were stalked and monitored, made to kneel for hours on gravel, all of these sort of things, and none of them in 2021 were getting adequate care for PTSD. Um, sorry. Um, so at one stage, and you know, I will talk about a patient that I saw at that time, I was able to look after a police officer and treat his PTSD because he had turned up to a domestic violence homicide, but I was unable to treat her daughter who witnessed the murder. That is unheard of today in 2031. Unless you're a first responder, or unless you had been tra traumatised at work and you had work cover paper, there was no way for a woman to access PTSD care if her trauma had been at the hands of her partner. So back then when we had the mental health plan, we had 10 sessions a year. But we have to remember that back then, she rarely had anybody identify her trauma, let alone refer her to the appropriate services. Although some women could access psychologists through victim service. It wasn't just that, Psycho psychologists and psychiatrists were meant to be treating the PTSD. A lot of us had no training in providing trauma-specific care, let alone trauma-informed care. In fact, the vast majority of traumatised women would never talk to their health providers about their trauma. They would simply be labelled and treated for their sympt symptoms. So if a traumatised woman was depressed, she would have a depressive disorder and be given antidepressants. If she was anxious, she would have an anxiety disorder and be given anti-anxiety medications. If she wanted to hurt herself, she would have a personality disorder. And if she went to hospital, they would tell her that the hospital couldn't help her. In 2021, her symptoms were her illness, her symptoms defined her and her symptoms could make her a bad mother. But that was a bad old days. Now, what we treat is the trauma itself. Women are traumatized by violence are finally recognized as having experienced an injury. And that injury can be used as evidence rather than used against her. We now offer a range of treatments, recognising that not all women need the same thing. GPs are supported to give long consultations and they are confidential in nature. Those that offer this therapy must be trauma informed and must have specific training. There are gender specific inpatient units so that the admission itself is not traumatic. And there are specialised centres like the Trauma Recovery Centre, which provide yoga, meditation, neurofeedback, EMDR and psychotherapy but it also provides access to other professionals that are specifically trained in recognising trauma. Specialists like myself will work in collaboration with child protection and legal services to promote the children being centred and children being actively supported to live with their protective parents. Children are seen as people in their own right, 
who are believed when they express fear and who have a right to safety, which trumps the right of an abuser to see them. They are now given psychological and educational support throughout their childhood to reduce the impact of intergenerational trauma. Professor Johnson, you were very inspiring when you talked about the ways that we can all make a difference. And I don't um, have anything more to add to that, but I would.